My name is Angelina Avedano and this is Interspace, where we explore the spaces between us. Join me for discussions on a series of realities with thinkers, writers, thought leaders, and artists. As a contemporary mythologist, scholar, and writer, I explore grief, transformation, and the creative process. Cycles of life, death, and rebirth inform my work on creativity, healing, and metamorphosis. Originally, I'm from the Midwest, but currently I'm teaching writing, literature, and mythology at Massasoit Community College in Massachusetts. In 2018, I launched Cicada Personal Metamorphosis to help others tap their creative potential and encourage authentic self-expression. Hi everyone, uh, this is Angelina at Interspace. I want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening with my forthcoming book and to give you a status update. So many of you have been encouraging me, emailing, sending um, instant messages, and I really appreciate that as I'm going through this process and I've had a lot of encouragement. So status is, as you can see, I have the proof copy of my book. Some changes taking place. As you can see, it's got like not for sale proof copy. Very exciting to hold uh, the book in my hands for the first time. Uh, not look at it digitally on the screen. So it's a it's a happy and very emotional month as I go through this yet again and get ready to bring it into the world. And uh, so I wanted to share a few things about that with you. Huge, huge shout out to Jennifer Selig at Mandorla Books, who's made this happen. And um, I'm just really thrilled with uh, working with her in this process. And thank you so much. Very soon, you will be able to um, order your copy of the book. But right now, I'm just um, in the review process and looking for those who would like to review the book. Um, so I want to share a few things with you, too, about the story uh, upcoming workshop that goes with this work. And um, so let's talk a little bit about the book. It's uh, the title is Living Grief, A Mother's Odyssey of Surrender, Renewal and Mad Joy. I cannot believe I finally figured out the title. It was a, a, a very long two and a half year process to, to work on that title, but I'm very happy with where it ended up. So I want to talk to you a little bit about why mothers in this way with a mother slash S. And I also want to talk to you about what is in the book. Maybe read a little bit. So this book, Living Grief, is a memoir slash mythological application to my own initiation journey and process of coming to terms with my son's schizoaffective disorder. And many of you who know me know much of that story and my own process and the grief that is ongoing and the cycles of grief that I talk about in the book. Um, the Mother's Odyssey certainly uh, comes from being a mother in this process, but also indicates more than that and in that it's just a fundamental journey that everyone will take, not all mothers. Um, I mean, not all people are mothers, but they will undergo this mother odyssey um, with rare exceptions. Uh, only a few people, I would imagine, would not encounter profound grief in their lifetime. So profound grief can show up in so many ways. And I think sometimes we only associate that with death. If you've been listening to my podcast, you heard... Nicola and I discussing the uh, death and non-death losses that come with grief. So there are lots of ways that grief is showing up in our lives today, you know, politically, socially. And yes, you know, in our relationships and families and with the pandemic, in our professional lives, I know that people are suffering and grieving losses of the way things used to be. Will they ever be the same again? Also, I talk about in the book, illnesses and uh, injuries can also 
instigate this uh, this passage, this grief passage of profound loss. You lose a part of yourself. It really takes you into a, a deep a depth of grief that um, is often unacknowledged. So I just want to start with that to say. Uh, Living grief, a mother's odyssey, is not just about mothers. It's not just about the loss of a child or experiencing grief related to children. Um, however, what we I think we all understand and why we can use that term mother is that it's generally accepted that one of the most profound losses anyone can encounter or a woman can encounter is a loss of a child. So we all know that it's big, it's profound, it's powerful if we are talking about grief and the mother's odyssey. And it also means something primal, fundamental, primary, the mother of all griefs in one way. You might be able to explain that or describe it. It's a situation in your life that breaks you down and makes you reevaluate everything. You could lose your faith, another profound grief passage, um, losing your innocence. Um, all of these instigate in us profound losses. And this is what the book is about and what my workshops are about. The workshop that goes with this book is called Transforming Loss, and I do want to talk a little bit about that. It's um, I'm going to run that workshop again uh, beginning January 31st, and I'm limiting that to eight people because what I have um, determined in the, in the previous workshop is it's, it's a very intimate space. It is a place uh, that needs to be contained and held with, uh, with love and openness and really in order to give everyone the kind of space and attention they need from me, it needs to be a small group. So um, if you're interested in what I'm sharing with you today and would like to be a part of that, just know that um, those seats are filling up and um, I want you to have that opportunity. Um, but I will have to cap it at eight. So um, you can contact me with my contact information at the at the end of the podcast. I also want to share with you a little bit about how the book came about. Uh, I think I talked a little bit about that in my first podcast, but I did travel to Hawaii two and a half years ago and saw my son for the first time in six years. And he was um, at the time held in a state run facility, um, in a psychiatric facility. And he had been living often on the street. And uh, as I mentioned before, my son has schizoaffective disorder. So it has been a long journey of um, since, to some degree, childhood, but mostly that manifested in adolescence and then in young adulthood. That was when it was very evident. That's when the hospitals and medication became in adolescence. That's when that all started to spiral. And so it's been a very long journey. He is this year going to be 34 years old. And this has been the process. This has been the, the pattern um, over all of those, all of that time. So I saw him for the first time uh, two and a half years ago, and it was such a, it was such a um, disturbing kind of mind shift for me to be with him again and to see how far his um, illness had progressed, at least in that, in, in the way that he was presenting at that time, <clears throat> I'll say. And I really had to face a lot of things in myself um, and allow my dreams for my son and our relationship to die in the way that I had been holding on to them. And so that profound grief event, I think y you might understand what I mean when I say that. We all have profound grief events um, in our life that just, it's it's like a tectonic shift in the psyche uh, and and for me that was that was one it was a short period of time it was about five and a half weeks six weeks and it it changed the course of my life and I started writing um 
this book, not really knowing what was going to happen, but I started writing really just as a survival tool. I just had to write because it was such a painful time. Um, and in the course of that writing, I really came to understand so much of my own process. It is not a story about my son, although it's a, it's about my relationship to my son. Um, I've tried to make sure that I separate out his story from my story. I can't tell his story. And his story is actually very different than mine and my perception of what's been happening all these years. So I can only tell you my story and how I've come through this experience and how I've been enriched by it, how I've been devastated by it, how I've been transformed by it, and then also how I came to make sense of some really senseless things, how I've I came to be empowered through the powerlessness of all of this. And, um, and then the workshop is my way of sharing that information. And I do that by um, using stories, myths and stories. As you know, I'm a contemporary mythologist. That's what I do. That's what I'm about. And so I'm able to use these stories, first of all, to help me make sense of the tragedy of this whole story and to find the transformation and the empowerment in it. And those stories are what gave me the ability to do that. That's what the book is about. I use stories in the book to, to kind of help contextualize the grief process and the cycles of that process. Um, I wanted to share something with you. In the preface of the book, I also talk about why it's important for all of us to understand grief today, I think this might help you to see the connections that I'm making with the grief we're, we're experiencing in the world. And, excuse me for a minute, I'll take a drink, peppermint tea with the cicada mug from my mother, thank you. And, uh, so... That's extra strong peppermint tea. The, the connections I'm making with um, the grief and the profound loss that we're experiencing in, on all levels in the world today. So I'm just going to share this uh, paragraph with you from the preface of the book. Even as I write this, our global community has been thrust into a collective grief passage. Our entire way of life has been upended by a virus a virus and the repercussions which will be with us indefinitely. Now more than ever, it is imperative that we engage with grief, understand its ways, and tap into its potential. On a collective level, we are experiencing now what every grieving soul has endured. Much of what we have come to depend on, our worldviews, our sense of stability, is under threat. Not only are we facing the very real and frightening prospect of physical death because of a pandemic, we are grappling with the death of our world as we have known it. Around the globe, individuals are reeling, trying to orient themselves to emerging cataclysmic changes, social, economic, and environmental. Add to this the trauma of reopening and examining deep racial wounds, and we have no choice but to confront the realities of profound grief. Many are feeling this enormous collective grief along with their own. Therefore, we now have an opportunity to understand grief on a more personal level and carry that new understanding toward our next inevitable encounter with loss. And so I think that explains as best as I can why it matters that we talk about grief, how it's connected to everything that we're experiencing in the world today, how it's not just about death, how it's not just about um, our own personal losses. But as I told you before, when I talked about grief, that we have this web of grief in our lives and everything is connected Every grief event is connected to another grief event. Sometimes they're small events. Sometimes they're these cataclysmic events. Um, 
but they are all connected by this subtle, thin, yet strong, inevitable um, strand. And when one grief event gets tugged on in our lives, it pulls on all the other unresolved and sometimes even resolved grief cycles that we've been through. And so we can feel that um, resonating and reverberating across our psyche, in our bodies, in our hearts, in our souls. However you feel that, that's what that feeling is in the center of your chest when you just feel overwhelmed by the sense of grief. Maybe you don't even know why. It is also why when we see the world the, on the national level or in the news or on a global level or in our communities, and we see others suffering or we see these grief instigating um, events that we also feel it resonating in our own webs. We are all connected by those webs into this collective grief web as well. And so I think it's really important to do that inner work so that we can navigate and mitigate um, the suffering that we're experiencing and that we're able to be resilient in the face of all of this tragedy that is all around us on a daily basis. Today in particular, it's overwhelming. Uh, this year has been overwhelming for so many reasons. I don't need to name them. Um, name your own. I, I'm sure you can list them. And even those of us who count ourselves fortunate for having work or um, not getting sick are experiencing it and maybe we even feel somewhat guilty or like we don't want to talk about that because you know there's so much suffering in the world how can you say how do you want to say well I'm one of the fortunate ones that's a good thing but um, you don't really want to rub it in someone's face that you might be grieving about something that doesn't seem quite as big as theirs well it doesn't really work that way there isn't a measure um, there isn't a comparison um, it's grief. It's yours. It's coming from something somewhere deep inside of you. And it's also part of the collective in that you're feeling it. We're all feeling it. We f we're feeling, um, we're c connected to one another. And to ignore it, to be unconscious to it, is only going to perpetuate our suffering and it's only going to continue the suffering in the world. So with that, I, I want to turn to another section in the book that sort of explains how I was working with my own um, passage, grief passage with my son. I did change uh, the names of my sons in my book. I just don't really want to be, when I'm reading or talking about it, I'm just I'm just hesitant to continue to use my son's name uh, or any of my son's name, by the way. Um, so um, I'll just share with you. I'm calling my son Stephen in the book. And uh, I want to read this section to you that talks about how um, this journey and our intertwined journeys um, in the book I called I talk about the tandem odyssey as, as he is on his own passage I am then thrust into mine and um, I'm sure many of you know this that sometimes we are instigated in our own grief passage by something that happens um, to someone else someone that we love we can't intervene we can't keep them from suffering and that causes us to suffer in a way that um, we didn't ask for, we didn't sign up for, but there it is. Um, and so this is coming from chapter two in the book, and I talk about my journey. My journey with Stephen has been an initiation. Now, as I survey the pieces of this emotional puzzle, I relive that moment sitting with my son in a psychiatric ward on an island in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean. Years of powerless, powerlessness, rage, and grief brought me to a place of acceptance. However, in my experience, acceptance is not something attained. Neither is it a final destination. 
It is an evolution. The wheel spins, sometimes slowly, sometimes rapidly. Each emotional turn is intense but familiar, seemingly eternal yet temporary. My son's schizoaffective disorders with its highs and lows, otherworldly insights and mysterious cycles paradoxically holds the key. It teaches those of us who love him to reflect not only upon our experiences with him, but on our own trauma and the potential treasure awaiting us. He teaches us what it is to be broken, to despair, and to confront our demons. He models resilience and calls it forth in each of us. It is because of Stephen that we are driven to that most agonizing yet rewarding point of vulnerability where raw honesty and surrender show us what it means to love unconditionally. And I think that um, this is what profound grief and the Mother Odyssey does. And this is what transformation, how transformation emerges out of something so tragic. We all go through our traumas and we may or may not find the beauty in them. Um, and it can be a very difficult journey to do so. Uh, those who have encountered the beauty in that journey and um, know on a deep level the cost. I think that while it is a an immense cost, it is a price with an incredible benefit, an incredible outcome. Um, but it's not something that you can set out to do. You know, transformation, as I said before, is not something, I think it was talking with Tom in one of our podcasts, in one of the earlier post podcasts, you can't just check it off your list. Transformation, check. It doesn't really work that way. So I think when people sign up for the course or they see the transforming loss course that goes with living grief, you might come to it thinking that, okay, six weeks, transformation, check. But it really isn't about the steps to transformation. It's, it's really about recognizing the transformation that's already happening. And that is the space that I hold in the workshop, is to allow the stories to speak and you to have your own experience with them, to begin to see the cycles in your own grief passage, your own mother odyssey, to see how the turns in the path bring you in new insights and how uh, what is required and um, how you might reinterpret that. But it's your own work. It's your work and the encounters with stories help you to determine for yourself how transformation is occurring. Um, and I find the stories to be incredibly validating. The rage, the powerlessness, the, you know, just the complete annihilation. And then also the promise, the longevity, and the resilience that they that they reflect and when we see that that happens over and over in stories we begin to see that that's happening for us as well all we all we need to do is recognize it is open ourselves to what is already there and so that's the work that we do um, in the stories with the stories in the workshop it's a beautiful experience to hold space and allow others to have that, um, that encounter for themselves. Talking about the cycles, in chapter three, I, I use the um, Demeter and Persephone story, and I think in one of, um, a couple of podcasts, I think we've referred to the story of Demeter and Persephone in Greek mythology, and I know many people have studied that, even in high school. So it's not, um, it's not an unusual story or an inaccessible story. It's, it's everywhere. If you don't know the story of Demeter and per Persephone, um, it's off, uh, Demeter is the harvest goddess. 
Her daughter Persephone is abducted by the god Hades, taken into the underworld. He coerces her to be, become his wife. Um, Demeter is in tremendous grief over the loss of her daughter. She wanders all over the earth. She, in her grief, does not allow uh, spring to come and everything is in a state of death and, and um, decay. She's angry with the gods and they have to intervene in order to spare humans and mortals and the earth. We talk more about the story and how that happens in the workshop and I do talk about it a little bit in the book. Um, but it's Demeter's grief over the loss of her daughter that, um, and the cycles that emerge out of the agreement that occurs in the end of that story where Persephone will spend part of the time in the underworld and then return to her mother, uh, for part of the year. And this is how we get spring and summer when, when Persephone returns and Demeter is happy. And then we have fall and winter, we have the cold and we have this kind of this is ex explaining the cycles of nature, the natural cycles of life. But these cycles that are reflected in the story of Demeter and Persephone um, are also cycles that, that are um, representative of the grief passage. If you think of Demeter as the grieving mother um, and you see her passage of complete despair and then having to come to terms with the way things are. Not even the goddess Demeter can change the outcome of this story. She has to learn to accept what is. I talked about acceptance earlier when I was reading. She has to come to terms and, um, and accept what is. There's no negotiation, not really. She wants her daughter. She does return for half the year, but she has to accept that Demeter is now the queen of the underworld. She has married Hades. Um, the decision has been made. The gods did not intervene to return her daughter to her the way that she wanted her. And things would never be the same again. That's the thing, too. Persephone's innocence is gone. The, the mother-daughter relationship is forever changed. Uh, Persephone is no longer um, the innocent maiden. Everything is different, including Demeter in her grief, the grieving mother. And so I use that story. It's, it's, it's just a fundamental story to talk about the grief passage. And I think uh, you've heard me refer to that with my guests in the past who've done grief work uh, with uh, Jaffa Frank and Nicola Tanyan. Uh, we talked about this story. Um, and so I also use it in my book in chapter three. And here's a small excerpt. While the grief, Greek myth of Demeter and Persephone is certainly a mythological way to understand the seasons, it is also a vivid reading of living grief, where one finds themselves in a continual pattern of separation and reunion. I found myself entering and exiting these seasons each time Stephen resurfaced from his long, mysterious absences, both physical and psychological, and each time he was lured by the call of the underworld forces. Then I felt the helplessness, sorrow, and rage all over again. In my experience, loving someone with schizophrenia replicates that pattern, and it is something I'm continually learning to accept. So this is um, showing you how I used that story to make sense of my son's um, presence and absence over and over and over again, as he would be off the grid for long periods of time, sometimes years, and then return and resurface, calling me, um, even sometimes showing up um, in the past, not so much in the last several years as he's been in on the island um, of Oahu. But he certainly surfaces and then disappears for long periods of time. And uh, that cycle is something that I have to, had to come to terms with, like Demeter. I couldn't negotiate my way around it. 
I've just had to learn um, how to live with that. And that's why the book is called Living Grief. And, you know, there's something about the title. It's, again, A Mother's Odyssey of Surrender, Renewal, and Mad Joy. And someone asked me recently, I'm really curious about this mad joy. And I don't think I believed that I could experience joy for most of my life because of this pattern, this recurring pattern. The grief was so profound that in long periods of time when my son, son was, was gone or absent from me, uh, that I just was in this emotional kind of stasis of just waiting for him to return and to to really experience happiness or to allow myself joy it felt like abandonment it felt like I was betraying him somehow and um, so it's taken time and it actually took the writing of this book for me to begin to allow joy in my life and to recognize that it could actually be a part of the process um, that I didn't have to live in perpetual grief without joy, that I could experience both and, and simultaneously. And that it's very hard to explain. That's why it's mad joy. It's very difficult to find words to describe this kind of paradox. How can you be joyful when you're in profound grief? Um, how can you see the beauty and tragedy. Um, I think some of you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you do, then you're just nodding or smiling to yourself. And some of you might be saying, what are you talking about? What, what, what on earth do you mean? How can you experience joy in the midst of something so tragic? Um, I felt the same way. I would look at certain images. I use images and stories to help me to understand that. And one in particular is an image of Mary. If you know your, your statues of Mary, um, we think of her, you can think of a lot of particular statues of Mary holding the infant Jesus, um, or Mary holding the body of um, the crucified Jesus, Mary at the foot of the cross. But there was this one statue, uh, there's one depiction of Mary in, Catholic and Greek, Greek Orthodox iconography um, called Our Lady of Sorrows. And Our Lady of Sorrows is Mary depicted with seven swords in her heart. Some of you, if you're Catholic, you probably know this. Um, you've probably seen this um, icon. Um, and I kept looking at the statue, particularly ones, because there's lots of them, there's lots of them where she looks so peaceful with these seven swords sticking out of her heart. And I just felt so conflicted about this image of pain and um, acceptance of pain. I don't wanna say resignation, she doesn't look resigned. She looks very tranquil. Uh, and we think of Mary as this benevolent um, goddess of, um, you know, peace, compassion, um, and tranquility. Well, that just didn't sit right with me because in my experience of grief, it felt very, um, honestly, it felt personally violent to my heart. It was, it was very uncomfortable. It was um, almost unbearable at times. And uh, I, I was angry a lot. I was very angry about the injustice of the system of mental health, this situation of schizoaffective disorder, of the loss of a relationship with my son, uh, the way that I imagined it should be. All of these things caused me tremendous grief and pain. And um, so how, you know, for much of my life, I could not um, reconcile any amount of joy in any of that. Um, but honestly, in that, perspective was only hurting myself. And that's what writing this book 
and my work with uh, Tom, as you've you've listened to him on this um, podcast, and we've talked a lot, and we've done our work together for years. But that's what the writing of this book and my work with Tom, and certainly the other uh, mentors in my life who have come on the show and talked, have really helped me to, um, in their own ways, all of these individuals, in, in through their writing, through their presence, through their conversations, through their support, through their friendship. Um, through their guidance have helped me to come to this place where I could find meaning in what seemed like it was meaninglessness. So how those cycles keep playing out and, and how you can find joy in that, it, it sort of it was very interesting that at this point in my life, the book is getting ready to come out. I'm, 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 I'm really feeling like I'm doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, we've been moving forward with the podcast. There's just a lot of abundance in my life with with all the things that I'm doing. And I'm allowing myself to appreciate that and be happy and to accept uh, this this phase in my life. And at the very same moment, at the very moment, let's say on Christmas Day, I'm really sitting with the beauty of my relationship, the beauty of the book, right? It's right on the precipice. Um, and um, I'm, I'm getting good feedback. Um, I had just finished the first run of the workshop. And it felt really validating that the work I had been doing, and this journey that I had taken was not only going to help me, but perhaps reach other people as well. There's just was so much joy and fulfillment in this moment on Christmas Day. And I was really sitting in that. Um, and I called my son. I had sent him his package. And I had sent that off with a letter talking to him about the book and that it was coming out. We had talked you know, years and years ago about um, how we might write a book together. And I was telling him this was going to happen. I sent these all off and on Christmas Day I called only to find out that he had left the facility once again. And in that moment, there was just this profound sense of shock and acceptance that here we are again, cycling once more into the depths of this profound grief. And yet this time is different. This time is the end of this huge amount of processing and coming to terms through the writing of this book and through the, the development of this workshop and through the um, presenting of Cicada to the world and doing the podcast. It's all happening at the same time. This is a very different cycle in the spiral of this pattern that has happened over and over again with my son and every time he leaves a facility or he disappears again and goes off the grid I don't know if I'll see him again I don't know if this will be the time that I have to let go of him forever I don't know what will happen next and how I will how I will manage but this time, I'm holding that at the same time as the joy. And again, there's that mad joy again. I couldn't even have planned it that way. But here it was at this very moment that all of this is transpiring. And last week, I received the return to sender packages in the mail. And here they are. I don't think I can open them um, until I know where he's at. Again, I don't know how long that will be, but I think the beauty of this moment is it, it kind of encapsulates what I'm trying to talk about, that in this profound loss, there can be held simultaneously the, the acceptance and joy and an and unconditional love and an embrace of the beauty of that synchronicity that just allows me to cycle again and know through this grief, descend once again, and know that all the people that are around me and that have supported me also um, will be there 
to stand by me as I process it. What it also means is that I, I, I really have to be conscious of what I need, the rest that I need, the support that I need. Um, I just have to hold a lot of grace for myself and um, the grief process. It can be messy. It doesn't make sense sometimes. It can be beautiful. It can be, it can allow me to have deeper relationships and deeper sensitivities that I, that I wouldn't have been able to have otherwise. I am thankful for my relationship to my son and the journey that it has instigated in my life. And I, or I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here with, with, I wouldn't have learned these lessons. I wouldn't have learned the treasures or I found the treasures and, and seen, um, and just really experienced some beautiful people in my life who have helped me to, um, to come to terms with all of this. And so that is really what living grief, a mother's odyssey of surrender, renewal, and mad joy is about. Um, it is what my workshop and my work is about and what I'm doing in my life. I live it every day. Um, I think maybe I wonder if, you know, all of this is a way for me to continue to work that process over and over again and to continue to make sense of it, even as it cycles once again. So I have to admit it was really hard uh, to to come to this point and, and make this podcast. I, 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 even though I know the truth of the vulnerability of it and the power in that, I also have a tremendous amount of resistance to it. And I want to hide from my grief and I want to, you know, go in my closet and lick my wounds and just, you know, be alone and, and experience that suffering. And if, and, and to be honest with you, if I need to do that for a while, I will. But I also know where I can find life and, and what nurtures me and what inspires me and what keeps me moving forward. And, and to be honest with you, um, sharing this and, um, shall I say, saying these things out loud helps to reinforce it in myself that this is the truth of it and there is balance in this paradoxical um, beauty and experience of joy and pain and grief and um, so I just invite you I hope you'll keep an eye on when the book is coming uh, right now like I, I mentioned before I'm looking for a team of reviewers who would like to review the book um, we'll be working on a, a book launch a, a kind of nice arc here for the next three months on I'm really putting the book out there I'll be doing some workshops some promotions some uh, discounts and giveaways and um, but honestly it's about helping people to to make sense of their own grief experience and their profound loss in their lives and I know we're all experiencing it experiencing it so no matter where you find support um, if I can support you in any way I would be honored to do that um, or I would be honored to help you find the the kind of support that would be best for you and I just encourage you to work with your grief to uh, make sense of it for yourself in whatever way that 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 works for you um and to find ways to support your own process and transformation um, it's that work that's going to help us bring about change in the world i truly believe that honestly it's the only thing that we have control of right now is our inner work and so uh, please don't hesitate to email or reach out if i can support you in in any way you don't have to read my book or, or come to my workshop, but I would um, be happy to help you um, find what, what is best for you on your own journey. So be well, stay safe. Remember that we're all connected in this work is the most important thing that you can do. And um, I'm just thankful that you're here and listening. My book, Living Grief, is a painstaking account of my raw personal narrative set alongside a mythological approach. 
It attempts to make sense of the senselessness of my son's schizoaffective disorder. But living grief is not only one mother's story. It demonstrates how loss, no matter how great or small, becomes a catalyst for transformation. The book launch is scheduled for January 2021, and it will be available on Amazon, Audible, Kindle, and in local bookstores. You have been listening to Interspace with Angelina Avedano. My heartfelt gratitude and appreciation goes to my husband, David Needs, senior production engineer. If you would like to learn more about me or my work, look for me on Facebook and Instagram, Dr. A. Avedano with Cicada Personal Metamorphosis. That's Cicada with a Y, C Y C A D A. Or you can email me at dr.aavedano at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. This is Angelina reminding you that we're all connected.